Welcome to the REI Diamond Interview, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom with Dan Breslin. Welcome to the REI Diamonds Monthly Market Update for June 2016. I'm here with expert economist and wealth advisor, Paul Sloat, founder of Green Drake Advisors based in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Each month, Paul joins us here on the show and fills us in on the economic forces at work in the national and global economy and what those forces are expected to do to the local real estate investment markets in the short and long term. So welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks, Dan. Happy to be back. How are you this week? Uh, things are good. It's busy. We're rock and roll. And I'm going to be honest, I feel like I had an experience I'm going to share briefly here before we get started, which I think will illustrate some of where we're at in the market and a lot of the things that we've been talking about on our episodes as well, Paul. So I feel like we're in a certainly a, a late stage, you know, like the music it could stop at any minute, you know, if we're playing a game of musical chairs here in the real estate market a little bit. I just feel like the prices are so high. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm seeing seeing deals, and they're deals that, you know, they should move, but we see a lot of this stuff, we'll say like a lower-end neighborhood, primarily a rental area. It's not somewhere where we could flip properties. And we're probably talking about houses that are, you know, when they're all fixed up by a homeowner or somebody doing business there, maybe they sell for 125000 And we're talking about a forty to $50,000 rehab. And I'd say two years ago, I closed a deal in this neighborhood with a buyer, and he paid uh, between twenty three and twenty four thousand dollars cash for the deal that we had put together for him. And uh, you know, I guess he did his renovation, his rental grade renovation, rents it out, and and he hangs on to them for the long term. And I was in the public record, the, you know, this past week, and I noticed that that same buyer bought a very similar property in very similar condition in that neighborhood for I think it was fifty three or fifty five thousand dollars. So he's literally paying double and there's like no inventory anywhere for him to buy at any other prices. So where we were seeing twenty eight to twenty five to twenty eight thousand dollars on the low end in this neighborhood, we're now seeing uh forty five to fifty five thousand dollars in this neighborhood. And that's just one specific example. I could give many more exactly like that that we're starting to see now. It's kinda like to me it's like, oh my gosh, even you know, even the lower price properties are starting to kind of get a little out of control, maybe just with the lack of supply. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping you'll shed some light on kind of the, you know, the big picture items here that I should be paying attention and our listeners that, you know, might help, you know, illuminate why some of that's going on or maybe even caution us to, to when we should expect that to cease. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start there. So, yes, the market is tight and no, there is not much inventory. So that is part of the real problem. If we went back to, let's say, 2011, prices were below where they should be if you looked at them relative to incomes. But if you start looking at what prices have done relative to incomes, they're really pushing the envelope. And part of the reason for that is we're just not producing enough Unit. So, for example, in the latest monthly data from the government, housing starts came in a little over 1.1 million units. As you know, we have said that housing starts need to be something like 1.5 million units a year. And, you know, we've used that number pretty consistently. So I think what's happened is we're not producing enough units, so there's a shortage of units, so we can start there. That's number one. And then, number two, we've got very low interest rates. And I'm going to talk about that. I was planning on talking about that even without your comment, but the problem is we're not producing enough units, and that's a problem. And then what's happened is that the amount of inventory out there as a result, has gotten really low and is about 12% below what it normally should be. So let's talk about interest rates and what's gone on there versus what the inflation data are telling us. As we said a few months ago, we expected inflation to pick up. And in fact, inflation is beginning to pick up. 
as we cycle the very large drop in oil prices, right? So oil prices are now flat or up year over year. And if we look at the other side of the economy, I call this the service side of the economy, which makes up the vast majority of the U.S. economy, inflation, wage inflation in that particular sector of the economy is running somewhere between 3 and 4%. According to the government, it's 3.3%. According to private services, actual inflation is running in excess of 4%. Uh, and part of that is housing prices have been going up, rental costs have been going up, and the big part of the CPI is what they call owner's equivalent rent or what we would colloquially call what it costs to live in a house. And another big piece of that is health care. And as we know, health care is going up at a pretty rapid rate. So when you add those things together, what you've got is very low rates versus accelerating inflation. So something doesn't fit, right? So why are rates so low? And these low rates are causing distortions in the market, such as you're seeing properties going at prices that don't seem to make any sense. But if you can finance them cheaply enough, it doesn't matter. So let's talk about why you have these really low interest rates. And I think the reason you have these really low interest rates relates to two things. One is the rise in the dollar, which slowed the U.S. economy. But I think the bigger impact comes from what's going on in Europe and Japan. I don't think we've talked about this previously on the show, but what those economies have done is taken interest rates below zero. In other words, if you have money in the bank, it actually is costing you money to leave the money in the bank. What that has done, coupled with the European Central Bank buying billions and billions of dollars worth of bonds, is drive not only short-term interest rates below zero, but drive medium to long-term rates down significantly. And what's happened is that international buyers have come into the United States to buy up treasury debt, which looks relatively attractive compared to the rates they're getting in a place like Europe, and they can hedge the currency risk. So that's driven our interest rates down at the same time as inflation is accelerating. So you have this kind of mismatch between what's going on in the markets and what the actual fundamentals are doing. But because what's going on in the markets is what prices the debt for buying houses, it's inflating what the value of the houses are. Now, on the commercial real estate side, while rates may be low, what we're starting to see, according to the Federal Reserve Senior Loan Officer Survey, which they do quarterly, so we'll get another read sometime over the summer, is that senior loan officers have started tightening credit on domestic loans for commercial real estate. And this is specifically for the larger loans for some of the larger apartment buildings and multifamily buildings. So what we're going to see as a result over time is that spreads will creep up and that as inflation creeps up, eventually the bond market should respond. Assuming that rates creep up a little and spreads creep out a little, well, Overall, the cost of financing these larger properties should start to rise and should start to put pressure on the prices that we're seeing in the market. But until that happens, you've kind of got this strange place in the marketplace where rates are very low because of what governments are doing. Those, in turn, are pushing up the valuation of real estate in what I would call almost an artificial way. And probably the real bubble 
is not in real estate because we're not overproducing, but in the fixed income markets where people are willing to buy bonds at extremely low interest rates in the face of inflation in excess of the interest rates offered on the bond. Now, what I know from economic history is that ultimately this is an unsustainable proposition, but it doesn't mean it can't go on for a year or two. And what's clear is that once this unsustainable proposition comes to an end, we should see a surge in interest rates for uh, commercial real estate, and that in turn should put pressure on some of these prices. However, until that happens, things can kind of stay out of kilter for a while, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. So if I go back to the 1990s, and we look in the late 90s and what went on in technology, valuations were kind of rational until 1998. And then for the next two years, they kept going up and sort of the pricing disconnected from the underlying economic reality. However, that didn't stop the prices from going up. Eventually, when we got late in the decade, early the next decade, and it appeared that we were going into recession, investors began to reassess these companies. However, these companies really didn't bottom in valuation until 2004, 2005. And by that time, those valuations were well below where they were in 1998. So what we can say about the commercial real estate area slash housing area for investors is that, yes, prices can continue to go up for a while and they can disconnect from the underlying economic reality. But over a four to five year time horizon, you would expect that the underlying reality and the prices of the assets will converge. And that is what we would expect, Dan, when we look out into the future, that the prices of these assets are going to converge, and that will solve the problem. And in fact, we're already seeing a little weakening in some of the apartment areas and pricing in some of those, especially the cities which have gotten overheated like New York City. And as a reflection of that, we have seen multifamily permitting really turn down as a reflection of, as we've noted before, the millennials beginning to buy homes and the fact that multifamily units have now caught up with demand for multifamily units. It's really on the single-family housing side that there is a shortage of units. So if we were look at the latest data, multifamily permitting was down 24% year over year for the latest month. So we would expect this to sort of be indicative of what's going on in the area. The annual run rate is 380000 That is really good. If you look at this in a long-term historical context, where starts have been below 200,000 and typically have averaged 300 to 350,000. So we're still, even with this pullback, above average in terms of units of production of apartment properties. But the real issue is the single family homes, where we're only producing 700,000 or so units, seven to 800,000. And the normal is producing 1.1 to 1.2 million units. So if we were to look at this, part of the reason that prices are as high as they are is there's a shortage of product. Part of the reason is that interest rates are low. And part of the reason is you're starting to see a demographic wave that's moving into low-end housing. And I think really there's a fourth thing that's gone on here, which I haven't talked about a lot, but we've had a lot of new people entering the real estate business because they think it's an easy business and they see people making money. That always happens kind of close to the end when things are looking good, but 
It's actually time to be pulling back. Unfortunately, what I would say is that you're going to have a pullback at some point over the next couple of years, probably when we have a recession. The likelihood of a recession is probable sometime in the 2018 time horizon, plus or minus. So getting back to the original question, yes, things are hot. Yes, they can stay hot for a while, as the technology example illustrates from the late 1990s. But, and this is the big but, that doesn't mean that it will continue indefinitely because ultimately economics rule and economics rule over what governments try to do. And we have seen this over and over again, whether it comes to manipulating the equity markets like China tried to do, where they drove their equity markets up only to see them come down, or Argentina, where they attempted to hold the currency flat and then the currency collapsed or other countries where they have tried to control interest rates in the bond market. And usually what happens is those kinds of things end badly, and we would expect this one to be no different than other ones, and it will end badly, because either one or two things will happen. Inflation will heat up, and that will put pressure on interest rates, which is what we think is going on because wage inflation is definitely accelerating due to the low unemployment rate. And then there's another piece to that on the interest rate side. We think that the ability of governments to effectively monetize debt, and we'll give you another little anecdote of what goes on when governments monetize debt, such as being done in Japan. Usually what happens is that you see a big spike in inflation and pressure on the currency and all sorts of unpleasant things happen. So here's an anecdote from the 1920s in France. So what happened in the 1920s? The French had issued a lot of debt because of World War I and they were stuck repaying the debt. So what did the government do? The government went in and bought the debt up and issued French francs in return for the debt. Well, that was okay in the beginning, but they did this for a large portion of the debt. So what happened? What happened is the currency came under pressure and inflation heated up significantly and went well into the double digits because the government was essentially printing money without any goods to show for it. Now, what are we doing in Europe and what are we doing in Japan? We're buying back debt and effectively maybe leaving it out, standing on a technical basis, but eventually the government's buying back its own debt and issuing cash. Ultimately, putting lots and lots of cash out there creates inflation, slowly at first and then at an accelerating rate. So while we haven't seen the bad side of all this money creation, ultimately creating lots and lots of money can be a problem. And it becomes an insidious one because what happens is that the real value of labor drops significantly. The easiest way to see that is in the minimum wage, where we see the minimum wage has more to catch up to be in real terms where it was back in the 1970s and early 80s. So despite the government rise, in real terms, it's still below where it was long ago. So this is a very long-handed way of saying, Dan, that when we look out there, the governments are manipulating interest rates, which has kept them below where they should be. As a result of this manipulation, what we're seeing is very low rates, and these low rates are leading people to pay prices or make investments they would not otherwise have made. As a result, when the markets figure it out and actually start charging the governments appropriate amounts 
for the money they're issuing and force them to pay real interest rate, what will happen is that the governments will have a problem, interest rates will rise, and ultimately financing costs will be coming under pressure. So, Dan, does that answer your question? Yes, I believe it does. Paul, <laughs> solid answer. Solid answer. So what we're finding interesting is that the data seem to be starting to, as we've said, expected a slowdown in the multifamily, and we expect the single family to stay fairly strong. That seems to be what the data is telling us with the big drop in multifamily permits and the continuing increase in single-family permits, which are running up 10% year over year. So is there anything else I can answer for you today, Dan? Well, I think we touched on, you know, quite a few of them for today. You know, one other curiosity, and I don't know if you'd be able to answer it on the fly, as you were talking about this, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, we have a lot of these hedge funds that put together companies and they bought literally hundreds and some of these hedge funds have bought thousands of houses that they're now owning as rental properties, you know, to kind of vacuum up a lot of the inventory, the excess inventory that did exist from 11, 12, 13, et cetera. Do you have any opinion or is there any impact in the market on those hedge funds becoming large scale landlords? Would you have any insight or, or what that may have already done or or continue to do in the market? Well, it's a little hard to tell what the ultimate impact is going to be in the market. For a long time, it made sense for them to buy houses because they were buying them below replacement value. Does that make any sense? Yes. And they were able to rent them out. And so that gives you a sense so if I'm buying below replacement value, I've got a built-in profit, right, when I sell it. So that was part of what was going on. But houses no longer really trade below replacement value. I think it's going to make the way the economics work for them and meeting the hurdle rates for their investors hard, especially with the kind of cap rates you're seeing on properties. So I would suggest that, you know, they are going to be a much less of a force in the market over time. You know, there's the potential over time if, especially I think, late this decade, early next decade, when housing really becomes the place to be for the millennials over being in rental housing, I think there's a chance that they could become suppliers of housing units into the marketplace because the rental market might not be as strong for them then, okay? And in fact, as we pointed out, between 2020 and 2025, we expect a zero growth in the number of renters in the United States, barring a massive wave of immigration. When I kind of look at this, I would think that those hedge funds, number one, won't be able to make their hurdle rates by buying houses where they are trading today. And two, ultimately, if the rental market weakens enough, they could end up selling a portion of the properties into the marketplace. I'm not quite sure if that answers your question directly, but I don't think they're going to be big competitors and bidders in buying single-family properties today because if you look at the rents versus what they're paying and the cap rates that are implied, it's very low. I know we looked at a uh, rental unit out on the West Coast for a client, and it was a two- or three-unit building, and what we explained to him was that his cap rate, after all costs, and running on a cash flow basis was only about 2.8% in terms of buying the property. So we said that would be very different than the property he bought five years ago where he made a lot of money because he effectively bought a property at the bottom of the cycle. So there's a big difference, and I just don't see the hedge funds as making the type of hurdle rates that they used to, and I think the cap rates are just too low for them. 
Yeah, and I think I asked a kind of a roundabout question. As you mentioned, I do know a few of the hedge funds I've met recently in the last couple of weeks. They've said the same thing. The inventory is tightening up and quite a few of those guys with the inventory. I mean, that was part of the plan was buy it low, factor in, let's say, an 8% cap rate on properties that they know right. are going to appreciate back to the replacement value and then sell to ultimately, you know, I guess, close out the fund with and meet, meet the hurdles for the investors. Correct. So I would think that that's exactly where you are. So it's a kind of a short-term play on their part. You know, we're talking five, ten years in and out, and then very few will stick around. And, you know, uh, certainly there won't be that size of the market for them to go after, you know, in five, six, eight years from now, unless we see another downturn. Oh, it's kind of a one-time thing. I mean, typically the way the private equity works, Dan, is that there's a market anomaly and you're able to buy stuff relatively low, because you're able to buy it low because of whatever's going on in the marketplace, you can then, four or five years later, sell it at a more normalized price. But four or five years later, you just collect your money and return the money to investors because you can't replicate what you just did. All okay. right. Well, so is there anything I, else uh, I can answer for you today? I believe that's all I have on my end. How about you, Paul? I think I'm pretty good. Oh, maybe I'm just going to talk about inflation for one sec before we end the call. Inflation is something that we think will accelerate over the next few years. I do think that your audience should be aware of that. We're already seeing that in wages to the extent you have maintenance costs or other cost factors built into maintaining the buildings, those costs are probably going to rise at a faster rate than they've risen over the last five years. And that's just something that people should keep in mind. So if they're paying X, they have to be careful that their rental rates are going up fast enough to cover the increase and an accelerating rate of increase in their costs. So I think I would just end with that one last little thought, Dan. Note taken. Hey, Paul, do you want to share the contact information for Green Drake and how people can get in touch with you and maybe get their hands on that coveted letter that you send me every month? Ah, the letter. Yes. Okay. <laughs> people can reach me a couple of ways. They can go to our website at greendrakeadvisors.com that's www.greendrakeadvisors.com and sign up for our letter or they can contact me directly by sending by calling me or sending me an email they can call me at 610-687-7766 or they can email us at info at greendrake advisors.com and uh, we will respond to their email. Paul, I'm going to just share my thoughts. You know, the letter for me, you know, I come from the real estate investor mindset. I I met, you know, I meet, I know I'm friends with a lot of the listeners on our show here. And I know that I have a one track mind and I'm like strictly real estate. And so a lot of times I block out anything else, any other financial news other than the interest rates. And it's very refreshing for me. And it's been a growing experience just getting my hands on that letter that you write, because it gives me so many different perspectives that ordinarily I wouldn't have any idea to go and seek that stuff out. And it just kind of helps to round off and help me become aware a little more of what's going on in the market, which is, you know, also the reason that we have these calls. So the letter's great. You definitely want to check that out. And Paul, this has been a great episode. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on here. Thanks for being a part of the show. And thank you, Dan, for uh, giving me the privilege of joining you on a monthly basis. All right. And thank you, of course, for listening to the show. As always, you can check out all of the REI Diamond Show episodes at www.reidiamonds.com. You can also make expert guest suggestions, submit deals you have for sale, and sign up for the new episode notification email. We are currently looking for real estate investment opportunities in the greater Philadelphia region, the Chicagoland region, and the four-county Tampa Bay area in Florida. 
Thanks again for listening. Dan Breslin here. I will catch you next time. And remember, here at the REI Diamond Show, we are dedicated to bringing you the experts, ideas, and strategies for increasing and protecting your net worth. Thanks for listening to the REI Diamond Interview. To receive the REI Diamonds newsletter and interview monthly, sign up now at www.reidiamonds.com.